Hello, and welcome back to Cinema 130. This week we're covering sound. It's going to be a great lecture that addresses both sound use in film and also music. So let's get right into it. I'm going to share my screen and away we will go. All right, sound in music. Here we go. Let me move my picture out of the way. All right. So here we Oh. <laughs> All right, week 13, sound. All right, this is one of our uh, final lectures. We are in the fourth unit, wrapping up the course. So complete the homework on sound. Next week, we will address producing. Um, there is no homework for the producing uh, week, but do watch the lecture. Quiz four will be on editing, sound, and producing. And for case study four, you have your choice of two films, okay? So not just one, but two films you can choose from. You don't only need to watch one. Y Tu Mama Tambien, which is in Spanish. It's a Mexican film about a road trip, really fun. And Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, which is a film that came out this very year, 2020. Will probably be nominated for an Oscar and will probably win a few, maybe sound editing in particular. So um, either one of those films, I think you'll like them both. Uh, and you can read about them and watch a little video of me talking about them uh, in, uh, in a couple of weeks in the, in the right module, I believe module 15. Okay, so let's move on. Sound is 51% of film. This is from Alfred Hitchcock. Now, what is he saying? He's saying that it's actually maybe a little bit more important than the picture, okay? Uh, this is an important thought because we, we think of movies, we think of the picture, the moving image, but actually the sound and particularly the music is just as important to convey emotion and story. So films are produced using human voices, music, and sound effects. These sounds are crucial for a film to feel realistic for the audience. Sounds and dialogue must perfectly sync with the actions in a film without delay and must sound the way they look. If a sound doesn't quite match the action on screen, the action itself isn't nearly as believable, okay? So we're talking about sound, we're talking about dialogue, special effects, voiceovers, Foley and ADR, I'll explain what those are, and of course music, the background music we hear in most films. All sound is added in post, except for dialogue, which is recorded on set and then synced together with the picture. Okay, so when we're on set, we're focusing on dialogue, all the other sound is added in post. Okay, so let's look at the categories of sound so we can clarify our understanding. We have what we call diegetic sound, whoops, and we have what we call non diegetic sound. Uh, diegetic sound is sound that has its source in the narrative world of the film, whose characters are presumed to be able to hear it. So we're talking dialogue, two characters talking, walking, rustling you know, playing with silverware, uh, street environmental noise, and music heard or played by characters, okay? So if they put on music or if they play music or sing, that's all diegetic sound, sound that the characters in the movie can hear. Non-diegetic sound is sound that the movie editors and director add over top of the scene, which includes music and score. Think about it. The characters can't hear that swelling romantic music, but you do which gives you the emotion of the characters. Also voiceover uh, narration, sometimes sound cues or certain sound effects are not heard by the uh, characters, but they're heard by the audience. So diegetic versus non-diegetic, okay? So in the, the way to talk about this is Birdman. I mean, you've just watched Birdman, hopefully, and, um, and you have use of diegetic versus non-diegetic sound, okay? There are moments when um, there are things that you're not sure if the characters can hear, like the drum soundtrack. It's a soundtrack, then all of a sudden you see the drummer playing it. So the, the director is playing with diegetic versus non-diegetic. Uh, the sounds that Birdman hears in his head, uh, only he hears those. Other uh, characters don't hear those. So the film really plays with that relationship. Uh, the scene in the street blends staged and cinema verite as well. So this is a good overview of sound and film, and this will kind of clarify a few things, particularly with regards to the Academy Awards. You know when you're watching the Oscars and they get to this part? Sophia and I are here to present the Academy Awards for the fine arts of sound editing and sound mixing. 
two separate awards with similar nominees always presented together. I'm sure that a lot of us watching at home are wondering what the difference is. Sound editing refers to the actual recording and creation of sounds. Not only sounds recorded on set, but also sounds that are recorded separately. This includes Foley, meaning a recreation of sounds that may not be prominent on set. Things like footsteps and the touching of objects. It also includes the creation of sounds that don't exist in real life. A film with notable sound editing would be Jurassic Park, where recordings of various animal noises were manipulated and combined to give a voice to the dinosaurs. Once these sounds are in place, sound mixing can begin. Sound mixing refers to the process of adjusting the levels of sometimes thousands of audio layers, dialogue, music, sound effects, everything. The sound mixer's goal is to blend sounds in order to create a soundscape that suits the needs of the film. They can make a scene very quiet or very loud. Or sometimes just one particular sound is made to be very loud in order to enhance a feeling. Other times, it's the opposite, making one sound very quiet. And sometimes it means intricately weaving sounds in and out of each other. Listen to the opening scene of Apocalypse Now, which won the very respected Walter Murch and Oscar for sound mixing. Notice how sound effects and music bleed together and set up the tone for the entire film, as well as expertly capturing the inner workings of the traumatized character. A more recent example. Okay, great. Really good explanations there and very good examples, giving us an overview. Let's dive in. I'm going to explain further. Okay, so types of sound. We have dialogue. It's recorded during production. All our sound is added in post, which includes ADR and Foley, which is diegetic. Uh, sound effects can be both. Sometimes they're heard by the, uh, uh, the characters as well as the audience. Music mostly is non-diegetic and voiceover is non-diegetic. So these are a dialogue is what we record on set. Everything else is added in post. Okay, recording during production, all dialogue, clean dialogue is key. This is the number one goal, okay? Uh, also, they will record something called room tone and wild sound, I'll explain. So dialogue, uh, I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. So this is what's in most important that uh, needs to be recorded uh, on set. And the, and the Godfather famously, uh, Brando mumbled a lot of his dialogue requiring a lot of post-production dubbing to fix, okay? Because he just was in character and he wasn't necessarily enunciating, okay? So um, moving on. Clean dialogue is the most important thing to capture on set. A lot of energy is spent to ensure the mics are well-placed and getting good sound. Fixing bad sound in post, as we just saw with The Godfather, is difficult and expensive. <clears throat> when shooting on location, multiple takes are needed to get good dialogue right. If there's a plane or a car horn, it will blow the take. Studios offer a controlled environment and are preferable for interior scenes that can be faked with a set. So that's why most interior shots, if they can be faked with a set, they'll do it because they can control it for sound. Okay, that's really key. And when you're shooting on location or even uh, an exterior, very hard to control for sound, very hard to keep it quiet, okay? And here we see a couple of shots and here we a boom operator trying to get clean sound um, while they're on a beach. So the boom mic is the one you see here. Okay, this is operated by the boom operator, all right? They get the mic close to the actors, but out of the frame, that's key. Boom ops hold the mic close and steady during the shot. They move as actors move to keep getting clean sound. Boom poles must be held out of the shot and not cast shadows or be seen in reflections. Think about that. There's a lot of things to consider. We need the boom pole. We use it to get uh, the microphone as close as we can to the frame. Um, but it also can show up in the shot, which is a problem, considered a mistake. And most uh, film crews work diligently to avoid that. Also, all crew members must remain quiet during shooting. 
to not spoil the take. That's really important. When you're rolling on a set, okay, whether it's an exterior, an interior, studio, or location, everyone has to be quiet and essentially not move to not distract the actors so they stay in character, but also not blow the take. One of the easiest things that'll get you fired on a film set is blowing a take by making noise. Okay, so capturing dialogue. Uh, sometimes that's very difficult. Let's say we've got a wide shot as we see here um, of this person talking on the phone. That's how are we gonna, how are we gonna mic that? We can't put a, a boom operator in there. They'll be in the shot, okay? So there's a few things that we, we could do. Um, we could change the angle as we'll see. We could shoot a close up and, sit and, and so we can get the mic closer. We could also hide the microphone somewhere. We could put a lavalier on him. OK, that's another way to handle that. So the, the, the key is you don't want to be seeing cast shadows or reflections. So capturing dialogue, um, shooting from an angle that obscures the lips, then you can use the sound from the close up. If you can't see the lips move, it can be dubbed over from another shot. So here in the example from before, now as the guy gets out of his car, is talking on his phone, we can't see his lips. So we can actually dub this sound in very easily. We could also hide a lavalier on him in this example. When this guy is shooting, we can record clean sound of what he says. This could be hard to get a microphone in there because we can't see his lips. Okay. So a lot of times microphones are hidden or the angles change in such a way that they can get a microphone close so that they can get clean sound. No clean sound, big problems. Um, another thing we talked about, radio mics, lavaliers. Sometimes you'll hide a mic on set as we see here, as long as this isn't in the shot. Um, lavaliers here are being placed. Sometimes there was a battery pack placed on the ankle, which would be covered by pants or a dress. And so these little mics pick up a lot of great sound and are hidden on actors. Okay, here's a couple other examples um, that will hide a lavalier here on the forehead, which will pick up her sound. You won't see it because it's so dark. Okay, uh, hide the live uh, lavalier in the tie knot here. When you've got a wide angle, how are you going to be able to, to get a mic this close? And also large cavernous rooms cause sound to bounce, making it hard to get good sound. So sound men will hide a mic on actors rather than placing a mic to capture all the sound of the room. So all these dynamics are things that have to be thought of where the mic goes, how you hide it, and what type of mic that you use. Uh, lastly, I want to mention room tone. Okay, so room tone is a low level home, any room uh, empty room produces. Room tone is added to the sound mix in particular places to fill silent mo moments and mix with ADR to make it sound natural. So you're basically recording silence in the room to use later in post-production. Okay, and every room that um, a uh, film will shoot will record a little bit of room tone of that room to have later in the production, okay? Also, there's wild sound, okay? The sound crew from Mad Max Fury Road recording wild sound from the vehicles used in the movie. So um, all this sound's gonna be added later. They don't need to record it while the scenes are going on, but they, you know, since they built these machines from, hand, uh, from scratch, they have their own certain sound. Well, let's just use that sound in the film. So they're just recording wild sound that will be added in, edited in, later in post okay this is wild sound these are the only two types of sound besides dialogue that we record on set okay so now we're moving on to the things that are recorded in post-production okay once dialogue is recorded during production and synced with picture all the other sounds are added in post-production sound editors find or create all their sounds for film okay so everything from shuffling to a teacup to a key turning in a lock that's all added in. It's either recorded or maybe they just have it in a library, okay? So first off, we have voiceover narration. And this can be easily recorded in post-production. There's no visual to match, so actors can perform freely as we see here. Now, in the movie Apocalypse Now, which we saw mentioned before, Martin Sheen's twin brother actually did most of the voiceover narration while his brother recovered from exhaustion from working on the film, which very, very much broke him uh, emotionally and physically. So let's listen to a little bit of that sound. Every time I think I'm gonna wake up back in the jungle. When I was home after my first tour, it was worse. Okay, so there's a little sound from um, Martin Sheen's actual twin brother, who obviously has a very similar voice, 
doing the voiceover. So types of voiceover narration, we have narration, which is what we just heard. Also think about phone calls, anyone that's calling in on with a message, you know, and we often will hear the recording, it'll sound like it's coming through a phone. That's all voiceover. Recorded messages, you know, could be announcements, radio, TV broadcasts, uh, alerts, uh, warnings over a PA system, and even internal monologue when sometimes the writer lets us hear the inner thoughts of the character. That's all voiceover. And these are different things that are recorded in post. Next up, we have ADR looping or dubbing. These are all the same thing. ADR looping or dubbing. ADR sounds for, stands for additional dialogue recording. Okay, same as looping, same as dubbing. So this is when you go back and re-record the dialogue that you recorded on set, okay? So when dialogue is compromised or not clean, sometimes ADR is needed, okay? This is common. It involves the actors coming into a studio and watching the footage while they speak the dialogue into a mic. It's recorded and synced to the picture, okay? And this is common for exterior location shoots because of the noise factor, because of the inability to always control the background noise. The tricky part of ADR is getting the new dialogue to sound like it comes from the image on the screen. So what they do is they take the uh, room tone that they recorded uh, at the location, and they mix it in the bed underneath the new ADR recording of the actor in the studio. So reasons for ADR, poor sound quality due to technical issues or background noise, to improve performance or even change small bits of dialogue. So let me give you an example of that. Um, when they were shooting the film uh, Dr. Strangelove, there's a line in the movie where a character says, a fellow could have a good weekend in Dallas with all that. Well, that was the film came out right after the Kennedy assassination, which took place in Dallas. So they went back in and they dubbed out Dallas and put in Vegas. So there's an example of how ADR can be used to fix or change dialogue for certain reasons. Uh, okay, and lastly, sometimes they do want to change the voice of the actor on the, on the screen, or maybe the actor feels like their performance could be better if they did it in ADR over top of what they did live. So let's move on. All right. So, oh, actually, yeah, let's hear. I want to hear a little bit of this. Watch, uh, listen to this. Okay. So, that was a sample of an ADR session where the uh, actor watches what's on the screen and they record the dialogue. Okay. Moving on now to Foley. Many of you might know what Foley is if you've taken a, a tour of Universal Studios. It's one of the popular um, sites on, on that tour. Foley artists create the common sounds we hear in any film from walking to phone rings to silverware. Anytime an actor touches something, a key goes in a lock, that's all created through Foley. And this is a Foley studio that you see here with all the various um, little pits there are different sounds they can, uh, different pits they can use to make different sounds for walking, okay? So here we see a Foley artist watching what's on the screen and they're creating the sounds of, I guess, characters walking on brick as we see here. And you see all these different textures that they have. This is what a Foley studio has, has different textures. And the, um, the sound artist here is listening to what's going on, listening to the dialogue, watching what's on screen, and very artfully matching the physical actions, okay? All right. So it's important to note that Foley artists are matching human actions. The sounds of, say, cars going by or wind blowing, that can all be done by the sound editor because it doesn't have to be timed precisely to human actions. What the Foley artists do, and that's what they're called, is they're very skilled at in very few takes matching and sounding like what's going on the screen with their physical actions and their scrapings and their noise. And so that's what Foley artists cover, okay? The Foley artists create the human created sounds on screen because they can time the sounds to make them sound natural. Let's listen to an example here. Okay, so that's what, we, what we're hearing there is this guy walking on the on the uh, ground there then recording that sound he's matching it to the action we see on the screen okay so another thing that we add in post is our sound effects okay and they could be the sound of you know things colliding cars exploding anything could be eerie sound effects or mysterious sound effects in a sci-fi or horror film okay 
Um, everything in a sci-fi film is essentially a sound effect. What sound does this button make when you push it? Okay, so that's all created by the sound designer. We'll come to that person in a moment. So let me, let's listen to a, a sound effect here that I have recorded for you. So what we're listening to is a, is, is a sound library, okay? And these are just different sounds that uh, have been recorded that any sound designer is gonna have access to. They, ha he has them themselves. Here's a bunch of different samples down here. And uh, these uh, sounds are just gonna be dropped in whenever they're needed. So they have sounds for all kinds of things. What does it sound like when a bowling ball rolls on a floor? All these different sounds are pre-recorded. Sound designers will sample them and use them, okay? So here's a real famous example. This is a little in the weeds here, but there's a, a screen called the Wilhelm scream. Okay, first recorded in 1951. The Wilhelm scream was initially featured as a stock sound effect in Raoul Walsh's Western Distant Drums and since has been used in over 400 films and TV programs. It's featured in every single Star Wars film, Indiana Jones, Buzz Lightyear. So here's what it sounds like. Okay, that's the Wilhelm scream. That's a kind of a, a bit of a famous film history. And I think many sound designers will use it and work it into a film almost as a nod to history, as a little bit of an insider wink. Okay, moving on, we, uh, to, we have sound effects. Now, sometimes in addition to recorded sound effects, as, the, as we listened to before, <clears throat> sound designers will create original sound effects. If, if they have a unique sound, or if they just want something that sounds fresh and real, they will go out as we see here and record. So here we see uh, a sound uh, designer recording uh, the sound of this old tank. So maybe this tank makes a distinctive sound. So he wants to get that sound, okay? And uh, this is done very particularly and uh, very specially to, to get very detailed sounds, okay? Once these sounds are recorded, they can be modified and mixed with other sounds in the soundtrack. Silence in film is essential. And it, as part of the palette of the sound designer of a film is to not always be blasting you with noise, but then sometimes to give you silence. That way, when the sound comes back in, it's all the more powerful. Also, while we're here, I just want to remind you again, we have our page numbers up here in the right-hand corner. Hopefully you're following along with your book and associating the terms that we're, we're addressing, okay? So getting on in, into this, we want to talk about the sound designer from Star Wars and his creation of the lightsaber sound, very famous sound in, fame, in film history. So let's watch a little bit of this. The lightsabers are one of my favorite sounds. And in fact, it was the very first sound they made in the whole series. For some reason, after I read the script, even though my assignment was first to find a voice for Chewbacca and then a voice for R2, and then, uh, well, maybe come up with some sounds from laser guns and other things. The lightsaber fascinated me at that time um, when the script had first come out. Uh, they had some paintings that Ralph McQuarrie had done so that there were some concepts visually of what some of these things would look like. And those pictures were very inspiring because they gave it an idea of the direction we were trying to go in the look of the film, and it was inspiring to me to therefore think up sounds that might fit that kind of visual style. And uh, I could kind of hear the sound in my head of lightsabers, even though it was just a painting of a lightsaber, I could really just sort of hear the sound. I think maybe somewhere in my subconscious, I had uh, seen a lightsaber before. Um, and I went to, uh, at that time I was still a graduate student at USC, was a projectionist. We had a projection booth with some very, very old simplex projectors in them. And they had an interlock motor which connected them to the system, which when they just sat there and idled, made a wonderful humming sound. It would slowly change in pitch and it would beat against another motor. There were two motors and they would harmonize with each other. And it was kind of uh, that inspiration. Uh, that, that sound was the inspiration for the lightsaber and I went and recorded that sound. But it wasn't quite enough. It was just a humming sound. What was missing was kind of a buzzy, sparkling sound, the scintillating element which I was looking for. And that I found one day by uh, accident. I was carrying a microphone across the room between recording. I was recording something over here, and I walked over here with the microphone, passed by 
a television set, which was on the floor, which was on at the time, without the sound turned up, but the microphone passed right behind the picture tube. And as, as it did, this particular microphone produced an unusual hum. It picked up transmission from the television set and uh, a signal was induced into its. Okay, so there we see an example of how uh, happy accident uh, sounds are found or created from unlikely sources. Uh, when you're recording sounds or creating sounds, they don't have to come from the exact uh, original thing that you're recording. They can come from anywhere. You can make any sound sound natural to what's on screen. All right, so <clears throat> now let's move on to how sound moves through a film. So remember, we have pre-production. We've been talking about this every lecture. You'll see creative meetings. A sound designer starts collecting sounds for the project. Composer may begin working on uh, themes for the, uh, the film. Um, you'll start looking at music licensing, paying copyright fees for the music you want, especially if you want a particular and popular piece of music. A sound mixer is hired for the crew and uh, also scouting locations with the set sound mixer. So we wanna make sure that the locations aren't gonna be problematic with sound. If there's a humming noise or there's a gigantic room, all that's a problem. So yeah, we're moving into production now. So now we're on set, we're recording. In production, the goal is clean dialogue. Everything else can be added in post easily and realistically, okay? So that's what we're doing now. And these folks are in charge of that. That's the sound recorder or mixer, sometimes called the sound mixer or the sound man, and the boom operator or boom op. Sound recorder listens carefully to all mics on set and monitors the recording of sound during production. So just as the cinematographer has his eye on the camera lens or his eye on the eyepiece, um, the sound mixer has his ears always listening to what the mics are picking up, okay? Any noise that seeps into the recording ruins the take. Often it's poor sound on a take that requires another take. Everyone working must be perfectly quiet while working, okay, or still. Okay, so this is an important point. Remember, we take multiple takes when we're shooting a film. So very often, it's a blown sound take. The acting and the camera might all be fine, but it's a but it's the bad sound that the, that the recorder is listening to. And he goes, oh, wait a minute. That's not a good take for some reason. Let's fix it and do another take. Okay. A sound mixer it brings all this type of equipment to uh, any film. He, he or she owns this equipment. And uh, this is part of what's called a kit. Uh, some sound mixers will work solo. In other words, they'll be their own boom operators. You see this guy, he's got a portable kit. He can adjust everything right here in front of him and you put headphones on. And um, okay, during production, dialogue's number one. I think I've covered that point. The sound crew any production there is to record dialogue, room tone, and some wild sound. Sound mixer on set, constantly listening on headphones to ensure clean dialogue, dialogue is being recorded. Quiet on set is uh, what is, you hear, and it's done to get good sound. It's to tell everyone to stop working. We're recording right now, we're filming. Uh, takes detailed notes to sync sound to various takes. And at times, multiple actors are mic'd, requiring mixer to monitor multiple channels. So it's a very detailed and complex job. And one of the most important, as important really uh, in the production of film as the cinematographer. Wild sound, a good sound man will also get recordings of wild sound. Uh, here's a sample here that I'll give you. Okay. Uh, microphone type and gear. All right. So we have all kinds of different uh, microphones. We have omnidirectional ones, bi-directional ones, body mics, a shotgun mic, which uh, sh uh, basically... Uh, captures uh, sound in a single direction, very good for um, capturing sound from far away. And a, <clears throat> a sound man will bring all of this stuff to set. He'll bring a full kit so that he has all these different tools to capture sound in, in the best way, just as the cinematographer will bring a dozen different lenses to shoot the film in a bunch of different ways, depending on what comes up. He doesn't know, so he needs to have all the tools in his kit. Okay, so let's take a look at some of this stuff. Uh, here's some examples of microphones. These are lavaliers that are hidden. And these, this is kind of a big one. Um, they have much, much smaller ones, which can be hidden and almost invisible. Uh, this is a shotgun mic. And this is a mic with what's called a dead cat. A dead cat is what is this little cover that goes on the microphone in case it's outside and there's wind. And the dead cat prevents the wind from 
disturbing the microphone and disturbing the sound. Um, here's some recording patterns on different microphones. Uh, you don't need to know this, but an omnidirection is recording in all directions. Uh, Carteroids and are bi-directional. They, they, they're sending direction, uh, micro, uh, sound recording in one direction. So if you know, depending on what kind of uh, sound pattern that the sound man wants, he'll use a different microphone on set to capture sound from a different direction. Okay. Post production. Post takes place mostly on computers in individual studios. So now we're assuming that we've got the production done. We shut. We've shot everything, and now we are in post production. The various files are then merged into the final soundtrack of the film. The post-production supervisor oversees the sound designer in completing the soundtrack. So the post-production supervisor kind of becomes like the director and he's just sort of organizing all the departments uh, as we move in. So now the sound designer, we've been talking about this person for a while. They supervise sound effects, uh, ADR and looping, Foley, sound editing and sound creation. Okay, so a sound designer is sort of in, in charge of all that. He might do any number of those individual tasks, or he might assign that to one of his underlings. Okay, so it really depends on how much work they want to do or how big the film is. A, the sound designer might just handle the creative aspects and farm out all the actual doing of it to other people. Sound designers are responsible for providing any required sounds to accompany screen action. They work closely with the production mixer, editor, and director to create original sound elements. Sounds are found, modified, edited in, and mixed, or they're created. In many films, all sounds but dialogue are added by the sound designer, from footsteps to wind blowing. Here's a little breakdown of how much you know sound is needed in a film. Uh, just the main thing I want you to notice is you know war and sci-fi films. Almost all those sounds in a, sounds in a sci-fi film have to be created. In a war film, the sounds of tanks and planes and explosion, all that's added in after. So sound effects are very, very important. Whereas, you know, a film that's more of a romantic comedy would be mostly dialogue and perhaps music. Sound editing. Now, sound editors could be, the sound designer could be the set edit, uh, sound editor, but sometimes, but very often the sound designer will hire a specific sound editor. And the sound editors layer all the sounds in and sync them up to the actions on the screen. Each sound gets its own track on the soundtrack. Uh, later in the process, the sound volumes are mixed and levels are adjusted. So here we see a bunch of different tracks and the sound editor uh, can go in and make sure that they line up with what's on the screen. So here's sort of an overview, all right? So we have production sound, okay? We, this is the sound, the dialogue we recorded on set. Picture and dialogue are synced, okay? That happens as soon as the shots are, are done. As soon as we move on to the next scene, all the syncing happens. Eventually we get to a rough cut. We covered a lot of this in the previous lesson on editing. And then editing further, we get to a fine cut. Then we end up eventually in picture lock with dialogue, which I have pictured here. All right, so now we've got picture lock. Moving on. Now, that's all the editing part. That was a review of last week. Now let's look at what sound does. So we have picture lock with dialogue. Now we got to fill in the soundtrack. The dialogue's already done. This is where the sound editing comes in, all right? So we have sound effects, music score, ADR, Foley, and voiceover, all right? All that gets added into the soundtrack to the already locked picture. So sound editors compile, tweak, and edit sounds. Sound editing is done on uh, sound editing software. Each track can be tweaked and modified to produce the desired results. Sounds must seem like they're come from the specific places on the screen. And so if it's in a big room, then the sound's got to sound like they come from a big room. They got to have echo on them. Well, the sound designer can do all that, okay? So let's take a look of some really great sound design from Saving Private Ryan. This is a, a great movie which captures the D-Day invasion. And everything that you're listening to, with the exception of a little bit of dialogue, is all added in sound design. Note the camera pulls out to reveal the whole crew. We started in on our protagonist. Now we're seeing everybody. Later, 
The sound is what's giving these men their fear, all the destruction they're hearing that awaits them. Okay, incredible sound design. And this film did win for sound design uh, this year in the Oscars and ne very nearly won the best picture. Now notice how the sound changed when the camera changed, okay, from being in the boat with the American soldiers to being in the pillbox with the German soldiers. The sound had to change and sound different because we were in a different location. That's called sound perspective. We'll come back to more of that later. Okay, so once again, everything can be tweaked and, and sounds can be modified so they sound like they co are coming from the location that we're seeing on screen. That's sound perspective. They have to sound like they would to the characters on screen, okay? Uh, one last thing that we do a lot too in post is sound cleanup. So sometimes the dialogue comes back and it's problematic. Anytime you're filming on the beach or where there's crickets around, that's a basic background noise that's going to change in pitch and volume from time to time, it messes up dialogue. So what they have to do is sometimes scrub out that background noise. This is called sound cleanup. Uh, and it's very necessary very often if you're shooting at the beach or any kind of noisy outdoor location. Now we'll move on to sound mixing. Okay, this is the final process. Okay, once we've edited all the sounds in, we know where all the sounds are going to be and what they are. Now we have to mix them. We have to adjust the volume. This is very much like the recording of music, okay? Your favorite band. They're gonna make all the sounds, but then they've got to balance. How loud is the bass versus the drums or the guitar? And this is the same in films, okay? So the sound mixer is the person who does that. And that's almost always a separate person. Usually sound designers aren't sound mixers. And um, once the sound in the film is edited, the edit is mixed, layering the various sounds in at appropriate levels by adjusting volume levels, maybe sweetening sound here and there. And that's a very particular skill set. People with very good ears do this job. And the final mix down sounds are layered, creating a realistic oral space. So the sound mixer knows how to make the, la uh, the uh, sound sound good together by layering them, okay? Mixing includes placing sounds in various sides of the theater speakers. So if a tank comes in on the left side of the screen and crosses to the right side of the screen, um, the sound must sound like it's coming from the direction that we see on the screen. So here's a, a sample. This is something called the Doppler effect. Let's listen. So that's the sound of a horn as the car got closer to us and then moved away, the actual sound of this horn distorted and it became more stretched out, changing the pitch. So sound mixers and, and designers will uh, work these little sound effects into their mix so it sounds realistic to the action on the screen. All right, so now we're talking about soundtracks. So this is all the various sounds in a film uh, layered on top of each other, all the various dialogue tracks, the sound effects and some are going to be raised, some are going to be lowers. These little lines you see here are actually the volume. So here the volume's low, then it's raised up to hear something, then it's dropped again, then it's raised sharply, then it's dropped again. So these are all the various tricks that are used in the creation of a very elaborate and detailed soundtrack that matches the picture on the screen. So soundtracks have many different individual tracks. There's usually at least one to two to three dialogue tracks. There's music tracks and you wanna have multiple tracks so you can layer them over top of each other. So you can mix them. So you can dissolve the two sounds together. So one is raising while the other is lowering. Of course you have sound effect tracks, 
Foley ADR, you're going to have no less than eight or 10 tracks on any film. Now, all that is combined into a single soundtrack that you hear in the theater. But in the actual, if you, you know, dig into the computer, there's going to be multiple tracks. Why do they have different tracks? So that each sound can be raised at its own level, raised, lowered, or tweaked at its own level to make it sound better in the entire mix, okay, when it's all put together. All right. So just to get into weeds a little bit here, um, this is individual uh, sound form. Okay. So sound designers can go in and say, wow, there's a little, I don't like this part right here. Uh, they can, you can actually cut that out or drop the volume on it so we don't hear it. Okay. So they can actually go in almost word by word. If someone has a, <clears throat> a bit of a, a tick or a pop on their dialogue, that can actually be erased. Okay. So this is the level of detail that they get to actually manipulating the individual waveform of the sound in individual tracks. So um, sound terms, this is towards the end of your booklet there. Um, just a bunch of different terms. I'm gonna explain a few of these. I've already talked about a bunch of those, but I'll just cover a few real quickly. The sound bleed is when sound from one scene bleeds into the next scene. Okay, so in other words, you have the sound of maybe an explosion still continuing into, even though the, the camera and the shot changes to something completely different, we still hear the, hear the explosion. Or conversely, you have the sound of the scene that's coming up bleed into the previous scene, all right? These are called J cuts or L cuts, and it's, it's a sound bleed. It's when sound from one scene bleeds either direction, either before it or after it into the next scene, all right? Very effective tool, very often used in war films. Um, the clapboard slate, uh, I think we've talked about this before, but real quickly, this is what you, know, you famously recognize this as a Hollywood artifact. And basically, this is where information is written here on the uh, various, uh, on the board here. And then this thing is lowered while being filmed. Clap. And what does that do? Uh, the camera records the action of it lowering, and the microphone records the, uh, the slap action that happens with the clap. And those two things are synced together. The picture and the sound, that's how the picture and sound get synced in a film. As simple and as rudimentary as it is, that's the way it works. Another thing I want to mention is off-screen sound. So sometimes there are sounds that might be diegetic, but they're not on screen. So in this case, from a horror film, uh, some creepy uh, sound in the distance or, or a heavy breathing of a, of a monster or something, and you don't see where the sound's coming from, but you hear it. So therefore, it's off-screen sound. Um, once again, we talked about sound perspective, and so I mentioned that before, but this sort of wraps it up. Sound designers and mixers tweak the soundtrack to match the visuals on the screen. The goal is to appear and sound realistic. Why not, why not calling attention to the mix? So sounds come from the same direction as their source on screen. So you might have, in this case, you might have the dialogue from characters on this side be a little heavier on the left, and the dialogue of, on, for characters on this side be a little heavy on the right. And they also have to be naturalistic to the room um, that they're in and the perspective of the camera. So like a big wide shot like this in a tall room, the sound's gonna have a certain quality. Whereas in a close up, maybe you don't hear the echo of the room as much, okay? And this is sound perspective. All right, now we're moving on to um, music. Um, the function of music in the movies is very wide. Music can serve several pur uh, purposes that are either important to the emotional side of a movie or help enhance the storytelling, okay? It's not only helpful, but essential for any director producer to keep the music in mind when planning shooting a film. So here's a little sample. I don't remember what I put here. Ah, uh, yeah, some romantic music. Very effective thing to use. Oh, ah, I remember now, it's Star Wars. Okay, yeah, this is some of the second movement in Star Wars, okay? And this music is very distinctive. The Star Wars music has been heard for years and years and years and over and over again. And it's um, an important part of that movie. So let's dive further into it. So music and movies. Without the music soundtrack, it would be very difficult to portray the emotional ups and downs of the film, scare the audience in a horror scene, and keep the audience uh, uh, attached in a romantic scenes, okay? So here we have a horror scene. So let me play a little famous horror mu music. I believe this is from the Night of the Living Dead. Is 
Yeah. That music just creates the tone. Whatever's happening on screen, we automatically become nervous for the characters. The music creates the tone. The music sets the scene. This is how important that music is in a film. Now think about romantic movies. How important is music to romantic movies? It's often, if, it's often what really gives the, the scene its emotional context, not even just the acting. That, 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 that's got to be good too, but it's that swelling music that really, really captures the scene and makes us feel what the characters are feeling. So music in movies, music-based films as a percentage of all feature films has really gone down. Uh, this only goes through 2017. Used to be much bigger through the uh, 50s and in the 60s. It really started declining. And now I think it's on a slight uptick, but not as much as it used to be. Uh, highest grossing music-based movies from 94 to 2018. We had many. Of course, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody was very popular. Uh, it is getting more popular. Uh, one position I want to point out in, on a, as part of the music crew, if you will, would be the music supervisor. Not all films have one, but many do. So a music supervisor is brought in to find music that suits the tone and time period of a film. This is going to be especially important if you're doing a very youth-oriented film, which has young characters, and you're going to have young current music in it. Or if you're doing a period piece and you want to have the 70s or the 80s or what have you, you want to create that mood in the music or that mood in the movie with the music, okay? So young audiences are attracted to a movie by a hot soundtrack. And one example was uh, Queen and Slim. Uh, it was one of the best parts of the film was the soundtrack that they used, composed by the music supervisor. There we go, a little sound cue. So music licensing, if you're using pre-recorded song or another pre-recorded piece of music in your film, there are two rights you need to secure. And these are called synchronization license and master use license. And you get both of these from ASCAP, which is an organization along with BMI that control libraries and thousands of millions of songs that you go. And this is pretty standard. It's done every day. And this is handled by the music supervisor. In addition to selecting the music, he must also apply to use the music filing for licenses and paying the fees. This stuff doesn't come for free, okay? And the more popular the song, the more important, the bigger the song, the more expensive it's gonna be. Also, we have songwriters. Songwriters contribute songs to movies all the time. There's an Oscar given for best song and very often that can help a film because the popular song is played on the radio maybe. Uh, sometimes a music producer or musician will be hired to create the entire music soundtrack for a movie uh, as uh, Johnny Greenwood did for um, There Will Be Blood, okay? This is, can be especially important to teen-oriented films if they select the right songwriter who maybe is popular at the time. Also, you have composers, which is a little different from a songwriter, okay? Composer is, is writing for an entire orchestra or a larger instrumentation as opposed to writing individual songs. Um, so there's two ways that, that composers will work. So some composers and songwriters will write songs for a film before it's finished. In other words, they get the idea for the film, oh, you want a romantic song for a Western? So they write that song. But the composer of the score will do something different. The composer watches the partially finished film and composes music for specific scenes and moments in the film. The composition is based on the motion seen in the screen. So in one example, once you get to picture lock or very close, the film is finished, the comp composer will watch it or have a copy of it and will compose the music to match the beats that have already been edited in the film. Okay, so that's one way of composing. That's called a score. Other people will just write music that the editors and the sound designer will then put wherever he wants in the soundtrack to match the action. But when someone composes a score, they've composed it for specific scenes, specific moments, and specific edits, okay? So film score is original music written specifically to accompany a film. The score forms part of the film soundtrack, which also includes dialogue, foley, sound effects, and even sometimes other music, okay? And uh, so very important film scores. And they often have something called cues, which are times to begin and end at specific points during the film, okay? So maybe they, uh, the music will really accent the action or will also signal a tone shift, like if we've gone from dramatic to sad because maybe a character has died. One of the most famous composers was Sergio Leone, or excuse me, was Ennio Morricone. He was the composer and the director that he worked with the most was Sergio Leone, an Italian director. So what's really interesting about them is Morricone wrote the music first. 
So he would, uh, the director would say, here's my themes, here's what I want. Marconi would write the music first, and then the director would play the music on set during production. And he would have the actors sort of almost act to or be influenced by the sound of the music, which is really pretty fantastic. I'm sure you've seen some of these movies. Uh, many of them are called spaghetti westerns. So soundtracks. Now, when you think of the word soundtrack, what you often think of, of all the songs that you associate with a film, that's sometimes called a soundtrack. That's not the technical term that is used in the business, but a soundtracks or movie soundtracks make for great listening and additional revenue for a film. Uh, the selected songs can capture the feeling of the story, the time period, or feature new songs by young artists. So when we, you know, the soundtrack that's sold to you is, is called the soundtrack, but it's not the same soundtrack that is the, the, the essential audio recording of all, all the sounds in the film that accompany the picture, okay? So a couple music milestones in movies. Um, sound was first introduced in 1927, the jazz singer. Full diegetic sound from then on. Orchestral scores started uh, being used, particularly in the 30s. Musicals became popular through the 30s through the 60s. Uh, pop music, found music really got going in the 1960s when the, the sort of baby, June, baby boom generation came in. Um, they wanted to hear their music. So it started showing up in movies um, using popular music. We saw a return of the orchestral score in 76 with Star Wars and Jaws. In the 80s, we saw the introduction of electronic synth. And then uh, later in the 90s with uh, Tarantino, we'll see a return to the pop soundtrack. So a couple of milestones. Uh, High Noon was one of the first songs to have a single, Oh My Darling, which uh, won best song and, and also brought attention to the film. In the 60s, as I mentioned, we have a lot of youth oriented films. Here's a couple of songs. I'll give you a sample for this. Um, this is from 1967, The Graduate. So this was uh, recreated by a group called Simon Garfunkel, who were very, very popular at the time. And they basically used a bunch of their older songs and had them just write one new song for the film. It went to number one. So it really added to the film's success. And then, of course, we have Easy Rider, which had this song, which was very famous at the time. Hey, a couple of examples of classic rock, and it was this sort of uh, biker rock, as it was sometimes called, that we see featured in Easy Rider, where the music was really important for bringing in the audience, but also for defining the tone and the spirit of the films. Okay. Uh, moving on to Star Wars. Uh, you guys will, of course, remember this. Uh, John Williams single-handedly revives the sound of the golden age of Hollywood with an orchestral score to Star Wars. Now, of course, Lucas got the idea to use John Williams from uh, George, uh, excuse me, from Steven Spielberg, who had used him to do the score to Jaws that was so important, that dun, 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 dun. So um, the orchestral score makes a comeback in the 70s and 80s. As we move into the 80s, we have a more synthesizer-based sound. Uh, here's a little taste of this from Blade Runner. Films like Terminator and Babe, uh, Blade Runner began using synthesizers for the first, first time. And we began hearing electronic weird sound we hadn't heard before. And you can see why these sounds would be kind of appropriate for two films about science fiction, you know, uh, about weird dystopian uh, futures, okay? Of course, we have Pulp Fiction. You might know this soundtrack, very famous. Um, as we came into the 90s, a lot of uh, 90s films brought back the pop soundtrack, started using that again, picking old songs or picking popular songs from the day. And the soundtracks in a lot of Tarantino movies are very, very important to his films. In fact, he composes scenes, he says, he edits scenes to music to make the editing musical. So he often knows what songs are gonna play way before he's even finished writing the films. Okay, so that's how important music is to his films. And of course, lastly, we have uh, uh, Hans Zimmer, who's famous for a lot of soundtracks in the 2000s. You remember this one from um, Inception.
Right. So Hans Zimmer is really famous for all these sort of big sweeping horn sounds. There's just a list of some of the big, big Hollywood budgets. Many of these films at Academy Award nominees or winners like Gladi uh, Gladiator, Thelma and Louise, very popular and very big, big films. He's sort of become the sound or excuse me, the composer du jour, almost to the point of now there's copycats of him that will give you the Hans Zimmer sound for money. And as we enter, uh, one of the last ones I want to bring up, of course, is Baby Driver, very popular uh, with the younger generations. Uh, the soundtrack from that film, which was, you know, basically found music. This one from uh, John Spencer Blues Explosion. This is from the opening of the film. Really pumps up the energy. Kind of lets the audience know they're in for a big big adventure and a big ride and this movie is all about the music and the action combining together it's edited to music it's meant to be very rhythmic very dynamic uh, the music is essential to the movie as i'm sure you know okay so score and their effects so very often score can have the following effects it can be commenting it can illustrate movement it can create atmosphere, the mood. It can create suspense. Think about uh, scores often create suspense. You know, the, the music lets you know you should be nervous or tense. It can portray emotions like in a, a romantic film. It can let you know to be happy or sad. Um, time period reference, okay? Historical music is used to kind of set you and make, evoke a time period of the past, okay? Set a tone that lets you know that we're in a different time. And of course, parody. In other words, Music can be used to make fun of what's on screen. And this, of course, is happening very often in comedies. Okay, so here's a couple examples. Comedy, illustrating movement. Music tells the audience how to feel and when to laugh. Music creates suspense or evokes the past. Music can convey time, periods, and nostalgia. So let's listen to a couple examples and see if you can tell me which are which. So here we go. So this music could be used for parody, but most likely this is a time period reference. This music is called ragtime. So if you're making a movie going back to the 1920s, that's your music. Let's listen to this example. Which do you think it is? I would guess portray emotions because this music is very romantic and very sad. So this could be used at any time period to portray perhaps lovers that are having to break up. Let's listen to another example. Okay, some pretty classic music uh, soundtrack uh, could be a few things, but I would say create atmosphere. It creates this uh, atmosphere of building tension. Something big is about to happen. It could also illustrate movement. Uh, that music could as well. So th that's classic soundtrack music that I selected for that sample. You'll hear that kind of stuff in movies very often to sort of build drama within a scene. Last example we have. Okay, well, you might have guessed it, parody. So this music is very silly. If you were to play that music over two people fighting, it would make fun of them, make a mockery of them fighting each other, okay? So it's very silly music that uh, essentially comments with parody, okay? Whoops. Let's move on. So um, we're now at the review. All right, you made it. Diegetic versus non-diegetic sound. We talked about that, understand the difference. Diegetic are things the characters can hear. Non-diegetic non things are the things that the audience can hear that the characters cannot. Audiences, uh, dialogue rather is recorded during production. All their sounds are added in post. It's a very important concept. Um, post includes things like voiceover, ADR, Foley, sound effects. We talked about all those. Production sound, that's when you're recording on set. That's your mixer and your boom op. 
we talked about what a sound bleed is. We talked about sound perspective where sound seems to come from the direction that it's coming from on screen. We talked about music and film and how important that is, how it can create emotion, set the mood, create, illustrate movement. Uh, we talked about the music supervisor versus a composer versus a songwriter, okay? What is a film score? What are soundtracks? And of course, we also talked about the sound designer uh, who, uh, who works under him as the sound editor and mixer. This might all be one person, but usually it's three different folks. All right. So I believe that wraps it up for this week. Let me stop the share here and we will uh, close. All right, I hope uh, that was clear to everybody. Covered a lot of information dealing with sound. If you have any questions, reach out. Uh, you do have homework on sound this week, but you don't have homework on producing, but make sure you watch that uh, lecture because the information in that last producing lecture will be a part of your quiz. Okay, guys, have a great week and we'll see you soon.